Over the years, I've come to notice that, when it comes to books, the most compelling, the most intuitive, and the most thought-provoking works tend to be those that very few people actually ever read today. Why they exist outside of the mainstream consciousness, including much of modern academia, may be for a variety of reasons. But in a great number of instances, it almost appears that the obscurity of these books, and all pertinent theories presented therein, is more or less calculated and intentional on the part of the intellectual class in an attempt to shield the public from certain ideas that run contrary to the dominant narrative being perpetuated by the mainstream literati. To find the most rock-solid evidence for this claim, one need only look to the classrooms of the modern university system, in particular today's philosophy, sociology, and history departments, and the rest of the humanities in general. Insofar as history is concerned, the Overton window of acceptable historiographical perspective has been so reductively streamlined that just about any view that challenges the academic consensus, that is, anything that rejects history as being anything other than progressive, linear, and non-speculative, is quick to be dismissed. And even for those historians who accept the gospel of progress, many of them also are too often discounted due to a number of other reasons, such as inadequate academic credentials, non-approved revisionism, perceived political biases, the application of metaphysics, or the simple rejection of empirical methodology. These days you will be hard-pressed to find names like Thomas Carlyle, Murray Rothbard, Carol Quigley, Amory de Ronquois, and Oswald Spengler on any professor's reading list. Even the esteemed Arnold J. Toynbee, author of what is arguably the most comprehensive and celebrated historical study since Edward Gibbon's The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, once on every history department's curriculum, is hardly even if ever cited by contemporary historians. The most unfortunate thing about this is that very often it is the lesser known historians and historiosophers, many of whom do not even dwell within the formal ranks of academia, whose ideas wind up being those which are ultimately vindicated by history in the very end. Lieutenant General John Bagot Blubb leaves his London home to drive to Buckingham Palace, where the Queen is to invest him with the insignia of Knight Commander of the Order of the Bath. The subject of this particular video is one such obscure thinker, the British officer, adventurer, and diplomat, Sir Lieutenant General John Bagot Glubb, whose cyclical theory on the rise and fall of nations throughout history remains arguably the most enduring analysis of the topic to date. A renowned soldier, known for his skilled leadership and gallant tenor, Glubb played an instrumental role in the shaping of the modern Middle East. Stationed primarily in the British-owned Levant, Glubb grew to know the local Arabs well, and they him. Over two and a half decades of protecting Arab lands from external foes and leading the Jordanian army to victory made him a living legend amongst the local population. Even today, despite his relatively obscurity among Westerners, he is still celebrated as a hero by many Jordanians. In many ways, Glubb could almost even be likened to a second coming of T.E. Lawrence, whom he even managed to surpass in certain respects. Born in Lancashire in 1897, John Bagot Glubb was the son of Sir Major General Frederick M. Glubb, a decorated soldier in His Majesty's Armed Forces who would later go on to serve as Chief Engineer for the British Second Army during World War I. Following in his father's footsteps, Glubb graduated from military college in 1915, after which he received a commission in the Royal Engineers. Glubb was wounded in battle while serving on the Western Front. Two years after the war had ended, the young soldier was stationed in Mesopotamia. Quick to befriend the local Arabs, Glubb earned himself the nickname Abu Hunayak, or Little Jaw, due to the severely shattered jawbone that he had sustained as a part of his injuries back during the war. In 1930, Glubb was promoted and reassigned to serve in the Royal Arab Legion, the regular Army of Jordan, then a part of the British Empire. He took command of the Arab Legion nine years later, right around the outbreak of the Second World War. During the conflict, General Glubb managed to turn the Legion from a corp of colonial auxiliaries into the senior most elite and well-trained military force in all of Central Asia. After the war had finally ended, Glubb remained in Jordan, where he continued to serve as the supreme commander of Jordan's armed forces, despite the country having since become increasingly autonomous 
Despite being a foreigner, Glub commanded tremendous respect from the dominantly Arab force. It was during this time that he received the name by which he is best revered, Glub Pasha. He also obtained a great deal of local political influence, becoming a close friend of the king. This proved worrying to Jordanian nationalists, who would frequently refer to Glub as being the de facto ruler of the kingdom. Latest camera records from Palestine show heavy damage in and around the Arab city of Jaffa as Haganah troops move up to new positions along the Warscard roads. The year 1948 represents a pivotal moment in Glub's career as a soldier. Following the formal dissolution of the British Mandate for Palestine, officially terminating the United Kingdom's 30-year-long imperial rule over the region, Hostilities immediately broke out between the newly formed Arab states, such as Jordan, and the recently established nation of Israel. Glub had been asked by King George V of Britain to stay on as commander of the Legion even after decolonization had officially occurred, and, with much controversy, led what was the largest Arab force at the time in a number of decisive victories against the fledgling Israeli army. Glub and the other British officers on loan to the Jordanian military were ordered by Parliament to stand down and leave their units in order to avoid a diplomatic crisis. However, Glub and a number of other commanders quietly returned to Israel and reunited with their regiments. In May of 1948, Glub led a force to secure the West Bank, and after doing so, was charged with organizing its defense. He remained responsible for the West Bank's security until well after the signing of the armistice in March of 1949, before eventually reassuming command of the Arab Legion once more. News of the dismissal of Glub Pasha, the British officer who has commanded the Arab Legion since 1939, came as a shock to all who have admired his service in the Middle East. His removal by King Hussein follows Jordan's decision not to adhere to the Baghdad Pact. The early 1950s saw a surge in Arab nationalism all throughout the Middle East, coupled with increasingly anti-Western sentiments. Despite Glub's reputation as a hero among the Arabs of Jordan and the Levant, Jordanian public opinion was nonetheless unfavorable towards the practice of placing foreign officers in command over their country's armed forces. Feeling as if he had no other choice, Jordan's king dismissed Glub and all other senior British commanders who served as officers in the Arab Legion. Yet despite the circumstances, Glub Pasha and the Jordanian king would remain close friends. Glub was formally decommissioned in 1956, whereupon he would return to England. Upon arriving home, Glub was given a hero's welcome, and he was subsequently knighted for his many years of dedicated service. Glub would go on to live for another three decades, until finally passing away in his home in East Sussex on March 17, 1986, at the age of 88. Upon finally resigning from the service of the Royal Armed Forces in the late 1950s, John Glubb, now Sir John Glubb, would dedicate his retirement to writing, and subsequently publishing, a variety of essays, articles, and books, the majority of which were accounts of his experiences as a soldier, meditations on his time spent living among the Arabs, and several works on geopolitics and international relations in the Middle East. His best received and most widely read book was his historical biography, The Life and Times of Muhammad, which is, and often has been cited, as the definitive and most digestible biographical account on the life of the Prophet of Islam. In the 1960s, Glub's interest shifted away from subjects pertaining to geopolitics as he became more and more invested in the history of fallen Arabic empires. Eager to compile a popular history on the story of the Muslim Caliphates, Glub's project ultimately culminated in three separate books being written, The Great Arab Conquests, The Empire of the Arabs, and The Course of Empire. But in writing about these great empires of the Middle East, the histories of which he studied extensively during his years of service in Jordan, Glub began noticing, for the very first time, striking similarities between each one. While each empire's history was unique to it and to it alone, Glub never argued otherwise, they all nonetheless appeared to exhibit common patterns within their respective developments. Glub eventually went on to test his hypothesis by expanding the breadth of his analysis. In 
He went on to examine the histories of various non-Middle Eastern empires that he did not know nearly as much about. Even so, his initial speculations were more or less confirmed when, sure enough, he observed very similar parallels within the histories of the other major empires that he examined. Upon doing so, he also came to a realization. Each empire went through the same exact stages of development in the same exact order. And it was from these very conclusions that Club would go on to develop an original thesis, a philosophy of history that he could call his very own. Club's theory of history is the subject of his two-part essay, the Fate of Empires, first published in 1978. In The Fate of Empires, Club argues that in order to properly understand history, one must first view history as the story of the human race across all civilizations, rather than as a collection of individual singularities, events, or eras. Traditionally, when history is taught, it is done in a linear fashion, with great emphasis placed upon that of one's own nation. To Glubb, this was nothing short of educational conceit. To focus on primarily the study of one's own nation, Glubb argued, is to ignore the history of the human race as a whole. And it is in this conceit that people all too often overlook the importance that other nations have had in the development of human civilization. Citizens of a particular nation are naturally inclined to view their history as the most important which thereby makes them blind to the common trends that exist between the respective developments of all countries. We are all apt to believe our own native countries to be invulnerable, and as such, unique to history. Sure, we may be able to intellectualize the reality that all empires that have come before have collapsed, but we are somehow still unable to process that the same fate will inevitably befall our own. All nations have been blinded by this same conceit, and paradoxically, this is why they all end up collapsing in the end. In refusing to emphasize the histories of other great nations throughout history, people thus do not learn from history. And the only way for us to avoid this fate of empires is to analyze the trends that have brought about the decline which all prior nations have tragically endured. To bolster this thesis, Glubb seeks to illustrate the trends that he argues all empires share regarding their respective developments, from their chaotic birth, to their triumphant ascent, to their gradual decay, to their ultimate collapse. To Glubb, it is the empire, not the historical epoch, that is the primary driver of history, much in the same way that the great man was to Thomas Carlyle. In this sense, in addition to the declinism and tone of urgency that pervades his thought, Glubb's cyclical theory of history may be likened to those of Oswald Spengler or Arnold Toynbee. But rather than taking the metaphysical perspective of Spengler or the staunchly empirical methodology of Toynbee, Glubb applies more of a rationalist, empiricist approach to his analysis. Glubb uses the word empire to characterize not merely a state that is ruled by an emperor, but as a catch-all term to refer to any great or major power that exerts hegemony on a vast international or intercontinental scale. This includes not only the likes of Imperial Rome, Great Britain, or the ancient empires of Mesopotamia and Egypt, all of which are ruled by crowned emperors, but also the likes of Republican Rome, the Soviet Union, the Arab theocracies, and even the United States, as all of them exercised imperialism as a practical measure through which to assert international hegemony. He differentiates this from the state itself, which, while always at the center of an empire, often persists in some diminished form long after its empire has collapsed. An example of this would be the modern United Kingdom, which, while once the seat of a mighty globe-spanning empire, has continued to exist in the form of a smaller nation-state after the collapse of its international hegemony following World War II. While he admits that exact dates often, if not always, vary from empire to empire, Club identifies that the average lifespan of a great power generally tends to be around 250 years, or roughly 10 generations. 
To provide some examples, he dates Assyria as having lasted a total of 247 years, from 859 to 612 BC. Persia, 208 years, from 538 to 330 BC. And both Spain and Britain, 250 years, from AD 1500 to 1750 and 1700 to 1950 respectively. And that one cannot truly pinprick an exact moment when an empire is born. But in picking these particular dates, he nonetheless concisely illustrates his point. Over the course of its lifespan, an empire will go through six different stages, each of which is distinguished by different social, political, and cultural features. The first stage, which Glubb calls the Age of Pioneers, or the Outburst, sees a small insular ethnic or pan-ethnic cultural group emerge as a major player on the world stage as they begin to forge their nation into a great power, either in an isolated region or atop a much older fallen empire which they had previously invaded and conquered. This is an energetic period in the history of the fledgling empire. The nation is bold, vigorous, and eager to expand, and there is a great deal of unity and cohesion. The Age of Pioneers sees them burst out from the hinterlands in order to embark on a series of exploratory or military endeavors beyond the peripheries of their homeland. This would be the earliest Arab conquests, the campaigns of Philip of Macedon, and the period of pre-colonial expansion that characterized much of the mid to late 15th and early 16th centuries with regards to the nations of Western Europe. Oftentimes this outburst is not typified by a single event, but instead by a pulsating series of multiple outbursts. For example, Spain's Age of Pioneers was characterized not merely by the expeditions of Columbus, but also by the reconquest of Granada from the Muslims, who had occupied the southern part of the Iberian Peninsula for hundreds of years. Multiple outbursts can also be identified as having defined America's own Age of Pioneers, such as the expeditions of Lewis and Clark, the Barbary Wars, and the War of 1812. This process can happen relatively rapidly, or take centuries. Regardless, it marks the beginning of a young nation's long road to empire. The second phase is what Glubb calls the Age of Conquest, which denotes the era when the empire sees its largest and most acute period of expansion. Again, this is a time of cultural cohesion and fierce devotion to the motherland, only it is enhanced by a feeling of extreme militarism and imperial pride. This is when the empire achieves its greatest military victories. The spirit of the age is most emblematically expressed in the figure of the soldier, who represents the ideal man. Generals and warrior kings are exalted and even deified, and it is often then when we witness the emergence of those men who would go down in their nation's histories as legendary conquerors. Men such as Hernan Cortes, Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, and Ulysses S. Grant. Although the Empire may, and often does, continue to conquer after the Age of Conquest has come to an end, such expansion is often less rapid, and conquest itself becomes something more of a secondary mechanism through which supremacy is acquired. The Age of Conquest is followed by the Age of Commerce, when the people of the Empire look to economic growth as a means of asserting their nation's imperial might. We see, during this period, large-scale urbanization, specialization, and, if applicable, the rise of a distinct middle class. Additionally, citizens of the empire grow largely concerned with the individual accumulation of wealth, resulting in a great era of unprecedented prosperity. Ethnically speaking, the population will begin to diversify as we witness the healthy influx of foreigners seeking a better life for themselves that their own countries are unable to offer. The poetic archetype of this period is, of course, that of the merchant, or the businessman, who plays an instrumental role in increasing national GDP and, furthermore, helping the empire achieve economic supremacy. The Age of Affluence is, in many ways, a direct continuation of the Age of Commerce, and is more or less characterized by the same exact features as the previous era, only taken to its logical extreme. Class is fluid, and society is characterized by meritocracy and social mobility. However, we also begin to notice a steady increase in economic inequality among the population as a consequence of this. On average, the majority of people within the population continue to get richer, but some get richer than others, which will ultimately serve as the basis for the growing class resentment that will come to define later ages. While there is still a healthy level of socio-cultural cohesion, and a common identity remains visible, this slowly begins to fade during the Age of Affluence, 
people become less concerned with community and civic duty and more focused on their own individual prosperity. As prosperity increases, life becomes easier, even for the urban poor. They begin to turn towards external pursuits and entertainment as a means of passing the time, and as a consequence, they begin to grow more and more complacent. The age of affluence eventually gives way to the age of intellect, in which we witness an empire achieve both its greatest scientific and intellectual breakthroughs. But it is also characterized by a significant amount of social upheaval, often as an unintended result of the excessive psychologizing that is endemic to this particular period. Society also becomes extremely litigious, overly practical, and concerned with seeking new ways to improve society, usually in a materialistic sense. The intellectual class becomes a dominant technocratic minority, resulting in elitist sentiments. Although scientific, technological, and philosophical progress flourishes, the moral character of the people acutely starts to deteriorate. The people of the nation become increasingly defensive, seeking only to hoard their wealth. The society grows more and more insular and self-interested, and eventually reaches a point where there is no longer a strong sense of loyalty towards the nation, as the focus of the individual within said society becomes based around the accumulation of personal wealth, power, and knowledge. And as the age of intellect comes to an end, so too does the high noon of the empire. Just as all men must age into venerability, so too must every empire wither away. Empires are themselves, in a sense, living organisms. Nothing that is alive can live forever, at least as it currently stands. Empires are no different. In the very end, their ultimate demise is the result of what comes about during the Age of Intellect, when the Empire is at its apex. The process of decay following the Fifth Era is very much the result of both internal and external factors. The intellectualization and psychologization of the previous stage inspire a sense of conceit and elitism amongst the intellectual class, which, albeit unknowingly, begins to sterilize the values and moral ideas upon which the nation was established in the first place. Whatever feeling of cohesion that had yet persisted into the age of intellect is thus extinguished forever, leaving behind a nihilistic sense of defeatism and meaninglessness. Without that sense of unity that at one time defined the national character, materialism and hedonism remain the only source capable of providing any semblance of meaning. Ergo, people turn towards such pursuits as a means of finding purpose, to fill that void which had been left behind by the cynical age of intellect. The superficial, relativistic morality permeating throughout the Empire's population causes, and subsequently continues to accentuate, the decaying integrity of all elements within the body social. This is what Glub calls the Age of Decadence. This Age of Decadence, which, while varying in duration from empire to empire, characterizes the final days of a superpower prior to its proper decline. It is called the Age of Decadence for a reason, for the moral fortitude of the Empire is fundamentally weakened, with only but a few still yet loyal to the nation on a transcendent level. Instead, the people are primarily concerned with material pleasures, such as money and sex. It is a deeply hedonistic period, and we often witness a steep decline in religiosity as well. But the moral depravity of imperial society is only but a small part of the broader decadence that pervades the empire during this time. Much of it too is expressed in the political arena. Although political division and fractionalization is normal across every era, previous generations were still often able to put all differences aside when their empire came under crisis, but not so during the age of decadence. The rivalries that emerged during this time proved to be more or less irreconcilable, and, even when faced with common exterior threats, these political differences thus prevent the people of the Empire from coming together as one. 
Another signifier of this decline is the rise of the welfare state, as fewer and fewer people continue to value the merit of hard work and seek to live off of a bloated system. This erodes the ethic of the people, and parasitism actually becomes destigmatized as a valid way of life. Economic crises become more commonplace, accompanied by increasing inequality and the destabilization and subsequent devaluation of the currency. Standard weights and measures are adopted, as well as, in a number of historical instances, a fiat system. Even as tax rates increase, the state continues to spend at a rate faster than it can afford to do so. Not only is taxpayer money used to fund bloated social programs, but they are also used to finance a largely unsustainable military. Despite the increased militarism that occurs during this period, the largely volunteer military force lacks the same sort of discipline and sense of national loyalty that it once possessed. Imperial overreach creates a net drain on the national economy. Ironically, despite the sheer level of military might that the Empire possesses, the military resolve becomes increasingly weaker. Soldiers are deployed to hold onto lands that were at one time able to be administered without the help of such a gargantuan military presence. Locals become rowdy, effective colonial management is practically non-existent, and military solutions appear to be the only means through which the imperial government knows how to hold on to its territories. When even they prove to be ineffective, the tired and increasingly pacifistic legislatures of state finally seek to appease their adversaries, something that their conquering forefathers would have never dreamed of doing. This is exactly what Glubb witnessed firsthand amid the dissolution of the British Mandate and the accompanying surge of Arab nationalism across the Middle East, and was, clearly and evidently, the prime cause for his dismissal from the Jordanian army, for he had intimately experienced nothing less than a direct symptom of a collapsing superpower. But perhaps the most evident symptom of this final stage is the breakdown of civic unity and the withering away of the identity of the Empire's dominant culture. All empires begin with an initial stock of people comprising of one or several ethnic groups, which dominates the society throughout most of the Age of Pioneers and the Age of Conquest. In most cases, it is a single group, as is the case with the Arabs for the early Middle Eastern Caliphates, or the Turks in the case of the Ottoman Empire, though in many other instances we witness an empire being built symbiotically on the backs of different ethnic groups sharing a common cause, such as the Latins and the Etruscans for Rome, and, as was the case for the United States, both the former Anglo-Saxon colonists and the descendants of African slaves, both of whom made up the initial stock of the United States' empire. As empires expand during the Age of Conquest, more and more ethnic groups from those conquered regions become integrated and even often easily assimilated into the national culture without issue. In some instances even, the cultural exchange that ensues can even add to and subsequently strengthen the young culture, together forming a cohesive tradition that becomes largely codified by the Age of Commerce. Empires are multi-ethnic by necessity, which is both one of its biggest strengths and most fatal flaws. Prior to the Age of Decadence, all peoples across the Empire are proud of their common heritage. It is seen as an immense privilege to be a citizen, and imperial rule is often viewed by weaker communities as being preferable to independence, due to the benefits that it may bring along with it. However, the Age of Intellect often sterilizes this feeling, thanks to the philosophical deconstructionism that occurs during this period. Notions of racial consciousness, anti-imperialism, ethnically motivated nationalism, and the desire for self-determination begin to surface in different regions throughout the Empire, as occupied peoples develop new, romanticized visions of a distant past long before the coming of the Empire. Thus, pan-imperial unity rapidly starts to break down. This also has massive long-term effects on trade and the economy at large. Under a single imperial mandate, there are no barriers to trade and the transferring of resources. But as more and more regions begin to secede, commerce, and especially logistics, becomes far more complex. In some cases, this will result in the empire losing access to certain resources that are necessary to keeping the economy running. One of the largest problems an empire faces during its decadent period is that of immigration. Prior to the Age of Decadence, when the nation is at its healthiest, migrants almost always prove to be a boon on both the economy and society as a whole. The phenomenon of immigration largely begins during the Age of Commerce, as outside peoples look to the empire as a land of opportunity. Almost always they are assimilated into the host culture without any trouble, and often do so with eagerness. For that is the natural expectation, but such an expectation is forgotten amidst the cynicism and cultural relativism that overtakes society during the Age of Intellect. During the decadent period, fewer immigrants are assimilated and in many cases are even discouraged from doing so. As a direct result, nativist sentiments begin to emerge within certain segments of the host population. In turn, they outright oppose further migration, and quite ironically, also refuse to help foreigners assimilate. 
The refusal from both cultural relativists and nativists to help foreigners integrate into society only alienates future generations of these immigrants and is a sign of an empire that has exhausted itself of any desire to do so. Thus, having little other option, these groups develop a tendency to isolate themselves into self-segregated enclaves, further eroding any common sense of unity amongst the wider population. The reasons for immigration during the Age of Decadence also vary significantly from the motivation of previous generations. Immigration, when an empire is at its height, is nearly always motivated by a foreigner's deep idealized desire to become a part of something larger, to pursue the dream that the great society promises. But during the Age of Decadence, when the empire no longer has that same sense of cultural unity, immigration is very often done for solely material reasons. This shift is all too often correlated with the creation of the welfare state, as we mentioned earlier. These newer immigrants are frequently still loyal to their adopted nation, but in times of crisis, they may be less emotionally inclined to defend the nation in the case of some external threat. Complacency, defensiveness, isolation, hedonism, greed, and dependency. These all comprise the zeitgeist of the Age of Decadence. It spells the last act of empire, the days of bread and circuses, of mass culture, of a society where all life is stripped of meaning. Where at one time the explorer, the general, the writer, the artist, the businessman, the statesman, the intellectual were the great heroes of society in the Age of Decadence. It is the singer, the actor, and the athlete. And even then, over time, their talents become less and less worthy of praise. From there, the moral fabric of the state's integrity only continue to erode until the empire finally collapses. Sometimes the collapse happens so abruptly that it does not become apparent until after the fact though many times it dies a slow, quiet death. For this is the fate of empires. To any conscientious scholar of history, it should be evident that we are now living in our own age of decadence. Although the United States of America might not rule over the entirety of the West, her culture nonetheless rules over the entirety of the Western people. The sheer number of similarities between modern American society and those of past empires during their periods of decline is, to say the very least, startling. Some might even say disturbing. For it is clear that these patterns cannot be reduced to mere coincidence. The fate of empires touches upon and subsequently highlights several very important truths surrounding the nature of social mortality. However, Glob's model is still far from perfect and there are a number of issues within his scheme worthy of calling into question. The first of these, as we mentioned earlier, is the arbitrary nature of the dates which he gives to designate the respective lifespans of the empires he discusses in his essay. To provide one example, he dates the British Empire, his own, to the year 1700. Although the first decade of the 18th century is the time frame in which Great Britain is formally considered to have established itself as a great power, one could just as appropriately place the date of its creation a century earlier, with the establishment of Jamestown, or even a whole two decades prior to that, amidst England's victory against the Spanish Armada. Similarly, and even more arbitrarily, he dates the beginning of the Persian Empire to 538 BC, a full 12 years after it is generally accepted to have been established, without providing any sort of real justification for selecting that particular date. Even by 550 BC, the year that traditionally marks the establishment of the Persian Empire, Cyrus the Great had already been king for nine years. Regarding Spain, Glob designates its empire's lifespan as having lasted somewhere between 1500 and 1750, when, in reality, it was never officially dissolved until after the Second World War. And while it would certainly be more appropriate to date the end of Spain's empire at a time well before that, it was hardly even an empire anymore by the time of its dissolution. Spain nonetheless remained a formidable power well beyond the year that Glob provides for the date of its collapse. Although eclipsed by countries such as France and Britain, the Spanish Empire was still a force to be reckoned with for the good part of another century, 
most questionable of all is the year that Glub gives us as being the end of the Roman Empire, AD 180, when Rome was still, in fact, at the height of its power. Officially, the Roman Empire was not dissolved until 476, almost a full three centuries later. And while Rome, excluding its eastern segment, could hardly have still been considered a superpower by the time of the late 5th century, it was certainly still the most powerful empire of its time a century prior to that. If we were to judge Rome on the basis of Glub's own scale, the state of Roman society during the late 2nd century AD would be most characteristic of the early age of decadence, thus corresponding with the reign of Commodus. Thus, it sometimes comes across as though Glub is dating his empires not so much on the basis of how long they actually survived, but instead shoehorns them in such a way that best fits his preconceived 250-year framework. Glub is also very vague with regards to his characterization of the United States, which he more or less accurately infers to be the greatest superpower of our time. However, he paints the American Empire as more or less having begun in 1776, a full three decades before it had even started to build something so much even resemblant to that of an empire. Furthermore, Glub places America's high noon at around the time of World War I during the presidency of Woodrow Wilson. Contrary to what Glub himself opines, this assessment could in no way be considered accurate, even by his own model, seeing as the United States did not even become the world's foremost superpower until the Second World War. This would be akin to dating the start of Republican Rome's empire at 509 BC upon the inauguration of the Republic itself, as opposed to the 3rd century BC when it actually began its proper period of hegemonic expansion. Secondly, Glub conveniently excludes the many great empires of history that did not enjoy a lifespan anywhere near close to his stated average of two and a half centuries. During the 7th century, Babylon was widely and accurately considered the greatest power of its time, yet it was conquered well before it had even reached a century old. Shorter still were the lives of more recent empires, such as those of Napoleon and of the Nazis, both of which scarcely lasted half a generation. Thirdly, while Glub's model is rationally sound and to a degree even overtly observable, his six-staged model of empire really only works when applied to those great states which emerge later on in the evolution of society, and thus cannot accurately describe earlier empires wherein the body politic exists within the framework of feudalism or tribal kingship, which are themselves often organized along the lines of proto-dynasticism, chieftainship, and division of inheritance as opposed to primogeniture, though in some cases succession wasn't hereditary at all. Ergo, such empires were often, in contrast to proper, more developed superpowers, smaller in geographical size, significantly more decentralized, and ethnically homogeneous. As such, given their more feudal, tribal, and heroic nature, they were subject to inevitable division by design, and thus do not fit within Glub's framework, themselves almost always being shorter-lived. To provide some examples, this would be the contrast between Charlemagne's empire and the Portuguese empire, the Holy Roman Empire and the British empire, Hammurabi's Babylon and the later Assyrians, or the Parthian empire and the Muslim caliphates. In Glub's defense, and possibly even to his argument's benefit, he does not make mention to such early society powers as those of the Carolingians or the Babylonians, meaning that, regardless of whether or not their exclusion was intentional, the fact that he did not mention them more or less keeps his theory intact. Although it would have certainly strengthened his thesis had he written another section of his essay differentiating between advanced and more primitive empires, this is precisely where Glub's theory of empire can fit in perfectly with the larger societal historical models of Oswald Spengler, Arnold Toynbee, and Carol Quigley, which examine entire civilizations rather than individual empires within those civilizations. All three of them noted in their respective writings that the emergence of large empires was a phenomenon that did not occur until a civilization had matured beyond a certain point, which, at least in the case of Toynbee and Quigley, was closely tied to the size and complexity to which a culture's institutions, traditions, and social mechanisms had developed. With this in mind, one can see just how neatly Glub's model can fit right into these larger civilizational macro theories. For example, if we were to place Glub within the framework of Spengler, great nations within a particular civilization would not begin undergoing the empire cycle until the culture were to reach its summertime stage, which, according to Spengler, began in Europe around the year 1500, which would therefore make Portugal the first true empire in the history of Western civilization. Also, given that the models of these other historians characterize cultural degeneration as spanning entire civilizations, rather than limiting it to specific empires, Glub's model could also play right into this idea so long as it emphasized that, while all empires eventually undergo an age of decadence of their own, continuous cultural entropy ensures that the decadent stages of each subsequent empire is all the more degenerate than the last. 
As such, even despite the small scale of Glob's theory, it provides a perfect complement to its larger, more in-depth cousins. Some may even argue that, doing so by taking a microscopic study like Glob's and placing it directly into the metamacroscopic context of Toynbee's further strengthens the thesis itself. Fourthly, and finally, the most glaring issue facing Glob's theory is its omission of many non-Western and or non-Islamic powers, which the model does not take into account. Curiously absent are the empires of the Far East, the Americas, and Sub-Saharan Africa. One might even argue that Glob's refusal to incorporate at least a handful of these notions into his model is enough to call his theory into question. However, Glob himself has enough humility to admit to the reader that his reason for overlooking any non-Western and or non-Islamic empires was entirely deliberate, as he did not feel that he knew enough about certain civilizations, such as India and China, to be able to appropriately incorporate them into his overall thesis. However, regardless of his honesty, the sheer absence of but even a single empire from one of those civilizations only creates more room for criticism, as it could come across to some like he is either cherry-picking or somehow suppressing evidence that runs contrary to his claims. Glub Pasha was a legend, in both death and life. Although his exploits may not be as well known or as well documented as other such similar heroes like Thomas E. Lawrence, the impact that Glub's actions had upon shaping the modern Arab world vastly eclipses that of Lawrence's own. While he may have been a celebrity for his time, that is, at least to the British, John Glub's name is not perennial. Thus, while certainly a fascinating historical figure and military leader, the strategic brilliance of Glub the soldier was nonetheless still no match for the theoretic and creative brilliance of Glub the scholar. But just like many other speculative philosophers of history, Glub is not, at least in the realm of modern academia, in vogue, so to speak. And unlike a lot of other underappreciated historians, it is not so much that he and his ideas are vilified or ignored so much as they have been merely obscured. The most logical, and most likely, answer as to why this is, is that most academics have probably never even heard of him, or at the very least have not bothered to read much of his work. That said, all of Glub's books are worth reading, particularly those concerning the rise and fall of Arabic empires as well as his Mohammed biography. However, if one were to only read a single work of Glubbs, it would need to be The Fate of Empires, his magnum opus. For it should not only be required reading for all who care to fancy themselves philosophers of history, but every history professor would be doing a service to both his own students and to the people of the wider world were Glubb to be assigned reading. Glubb's entire argument in The Fate of Empires rests on the assumption that nations collapse due to their short-sightedness and that the root cause of this short-sightedness is in fact that we as human beings are so concerned with the majesty of our own native countries and cultures to the point where we project upon them a certain divine aura of exceptionality. To avoid that from happening again, as has happened in every empire that has come before, it is critical that both ourselves and our children look at history as not the sum of what our own native nations may accomplish, but as the culminative totality of all human history. Glub's essay provides us with a means through which to evaluate the perennial conceit of nations. But the actual question is whether our society could even be functionally capable of taking the necessary steps towards a path of self-correction, a path that no nation or empire has ever been able to find. Assuming for a moment that contemporary Westerners were to suddenly awaken to the universal truths and timeless patterns of history, it is still not a guarantee that we would succeed in our search for survival. For all we may know, the sheer entropy of history itself could very well prevent us from being able to do anything about it at all. Yet, despite Glub's rational sense of caution and his bitter urgency, it is here where he departs from the pessimism that so defines the writings of Spengler and Toynbee. In fact, one could even say that he is somewhat optimistic as well. This timeless decline to Glub is only something that occurs because we allow it to. If only we would wake up and acknowledge the realities of the past, to learn the lessons that history has tried to teach us for thousands upon thousands of years. If only we were to study the patterns of history and learn from the errors of our hubristic ways, perhaps we may one day have the chance to defy the recurring doom that all nations before have befallen, time and time again. But only through proper dedication, purposeful action, and a willingness to learn, may we one day perhaps hope to avoid the fate of empires.